This so-called teacher of the year is now charged with doing the unthinkable to a young student. Brandon Hargrove is a high school teacher from Cluton, Texas. The teacher was arrested back in December 2023 after a former student came forward about historical SA. The former student stated that she had been in a relationship with the teacher from the age of just 15. Now this was back in 2007 and the SA is alleged to have occurred for two years following this. The student is now in her 30s and is coming to terms obviously with what has happened. She states that the abuse began whilst she was in school but the pair met off school campus. As a result of the charges, Brandon has been placed on administrative leave from her employer. She's currently charged with six counts of child SA, as well as four counts of indecency with a child by contact and two counts of indecency with a child by exposure. A fan was shot and killed outside the Miami Dolphins game just over a week ago. The Miami Dolphins have recently gained popularity due to their affiliation with influencer Alex Earl and her NFL boyfriend Braxton Berrios. However, disturbing events did unfold recently after the Buffalo Bills won over the Dolphins. It was on the 7th of January that the teams went head to head with the Bills winning 21 to 14. As a Bills fan left the stadium, he had no idea it would be the last game he ever watched. 30-year-old Dylan Isaacs was with his friends leaving the Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens. They were making their way to the car, which was just blocks from the stadium, when he was shot. This reportedly followed an altercation with another driver, and he was tragically reported dead at the scene. The driver was reported to be driving erratically and hit a pedestrian with their vehicle before the argument with Dylan. A suspect was identified and interviewed, but the rest is unclear at this time. Dylan's family is understandably heartbroken and his mum and younger brother have started a GoFundMe to raise money to return his body to his native Canada. I was kidnapped while going to buy a gift for my boyfriend at the store. Here's the video of me entering it. My name is Kelsey Smith and I was 18 years old. On June 2nd, 2007, I went to the store to surprise my boyfriend for our six month anniversary. Once inside, I began searching for what I needed, and then called my mother to ask for advice on which wrapping paper to choose for the gift. Little did I know it would be the last time I spoke to her, and that I was being followed by someone who meant me harm. Then, I left the store and didn't make any more contact. My car was found in the parking lot of another store not far from the one I was at, and my lifeless body was found 45 minutes from the store after the police managed to locate my phone. The truth is, that once I left the store, a 26-year-old man named Edwin Roy forced me into his car. The parking lot surveillance cameras recorded everything. Thanks to this, investigators were able to identify him, and it turned out he had a history of violence. They also managed to find this man's fingerprints in the car, and there was no doubt it was him. This man abused me and then killed me, and for that, he was sentenced to life in prison. Do you think his sentence was sufficient? This is the case of Stephen Kubacki. This is one of the most mysterious missing cases. So he was going to go cross-country skiing in Lake Michigan, right? By himself. And he was known for doing shit like that on his own and stuff. So people didn't really, like, think too much of it. They didn't really think, like, oh, he might die or anything like that. Or he might go missing. They were just like, alright, cool. Just let us know when you're back and stuff. Then the next day, he didn't come back at all. They ended up reporting him missing. The authorities started searching for him. And they see a foot trail. It shows, like, him walking in the snow. Out of nowhere, it just... It's like he was, what, carried from the spot, like someone like, took him, or... They don't know where the fuck he is, and he's missing for, like, months, bro. He went missing in February 28th of 1978. Out of nowhere, May 5th, 1979, which is 14 months later, Steven's parents get a, a ring at the doorbell. They open the door, it's Steven. The fuck, where, where was he these past 14 months? He doesn't remember anything, bro. He doesn't remember where he was. He doesn't remember, like, what he was doing in for the 14 months what he said he he remembers is that he was walking his shit started getting like hazy and blurry and he passed out i don't know where he woke up in a random ass field which was 700 miles away from lake michigan whoa and he had different clothes on and he had a different book bag on it's looking like someone fucking took him and like abducted him yeah because there's no way he did that and he doesn't remember that so apparently like people are saying that he could have pretended to be an
Joanna Lopez broadcast. This was some real life analog horror that happened on American TV. On January 14th, 1989, Channel 5 NBC, Chicago, they yeah. were airing the regular Saturday programming, showing like a bunch of segments, like PSA segments. Following that would be the US National Anthem. And remember, 24 7 TV wasn't a thing during this time. So the TV station would sign off at a certain time, leaving just the color bar screen until the broadcast picked up again in the morning. Instead of it showing like the regular, the like bar. it showed a picture instead, it showed a missing person. Instead of it just being for a couple minutes, it was there until in the morning. It reminds me of like the Salen Delgado. Yeah, exactly. Whenever I saw this sh bro, Channel yeah. Five too, right? Yeah, that's not creepy, bro. What made it more creepy was the fact that how it looks distorted, not really like a clear picture. It's it, very, very dark. Two years later, it happened again, but Person. it was for only a few seconds. <laughs> Is Joanna Lopez? They couldn't find shit about her, bro. There was no police reports, nothing. People were coming up with theories, conspiracies. The number it was connected to the youth department of the Chicago police. I was just about to say we should call the number. Call it, fuck it. Star 67, though. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Bro, what's gonna happen, bro? I don't know. All right, I'm muting myself. <laughs> People came up with another theory that she's connected to another person. I'm a pediatric neurologist and I met uh, Gypsy Rose after they just had moved to Springfield, Missouri. She came with multiple medical conditions, but it was not willing or able to give details about each one of the diagnoses. So I said, let's do new tests. We did an MRI of the spine and the brain, but I got the results that were all normal. Gypsy Rose didn't have cerebral palsy. Her muscles are good, her strength is good, and I think that she should be able to walk. This is great news. So, after watching the docuseries, The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose, I understood a lot more of how her mother was able to get away with all this. So, when Hurricane Katrina hit in Louisiana, Dee Dee and Gypsy went to live in Missouri, and when Dee Dee took Gypsy to see a new doctor in Missouri, the doctor asked for all her medical records, and Dee Dee simply said that she couldn't obtain them because they all got destroyed when the hurricane took place. Since Gypsy's medical records could not be recovered, the doctor simply asked Dee Dee what she had. Dee Dee essentially lied and told the doctor things that were not true, such as her having cancer and all these other extreme diseases. The doctor, in a way, trusted Dee Dee's word, but also wanted to run his own tests. And when they did, they discovered that Gypsy, in fact, did not have these conditions. Even though these doctors knew that Gypsy did not have these conditions and diseases, they didn't do enough to get her help. My partner threatened to leave me and set an ultimatum, so I killed my own 12-year-old daughter in the hopes of saving our relationship. My name is Penny Boudreau, and I'm a 34-year-old Canadian woman. After my husband and I divorced, my daughter, named Carissa, chose to live with him. During this time, I met a man named Vernon. A few months later, Carissa expressed a desire to leave her father's home to come and live with me, and I accepted this decision. However, our relationship was sometimes complex, marked by frequent disagreements. Fossed with these recurring arguments, Vernon reached saturation point and presented me with an ultimatum. Either my daughter left, or he would end our relationship. On January 27, 2008, faced with Vernon's ultimatum, I made a tragic decision. I drove Carissa to a secluded spot, pushed her out of the car, tackled her to the ground, and strangled her with a string. Back home, I covered up the horror by pretending that Carissa had disappeared after an argument. That evening, I reported her disappearance, but suspicion soon fell on us when neighbors heard us arguing. On February 9th, Carissa's frozen body was discovered in a river, stripped of her jeans, as I had tried to make it look like an assault. Confronted with the evidence, I finally confessed to the crime. For these abominable acts, I was sentenced to life imprisonment, with the possibility of applying for parole after 20 years. A man who disappeared almost a decade ago has been found newly deceased, but the mystery continues. In July 2013, Robert Hoagland disappeared from his Connecticut home. He was married with three sons, and his family were extremely concerned when they discovered that he had not taken his phone, wallet, or passport with him. 
He was last seen on July the 28th at a petrol station in Newtown. He'd filled his car with petrol and bought a map from the station. This was to be his final card purchase. He was captured smiling on CCTV and hours later, a neighbor saw him mowing the lawn. He'd actually planned with his wife to pick her up from the airport because she'd been on holiday. However, when he was due to arrive, he just never showed up. When she finally made her own way home, she discovered that he had not turned up for work either and his car was still on the drive. When police searched his computer, they discovered that all of his searches had been deleted. Now, Robert's son had been struggling with substance abuse and Robert had recently confronted some men associated with his son. This was in connection with two family laptops that had gone missing and Robert thought that these two men had stolen them. However, police looked into these men and found no evidence linking them to his disappearance. Police investigations continue to reach dead ends, but all of that changed on the 5th of December, 2022. Police were called to an address where a man was deceased. This man was Robert Hoagland. He'd been living under a new identity since 2013. He lived with his roommate, David, in Rock Hill, New York, and David believed his name to be Richard King. Robert had told David that he was newly divorced from his wife and wanted to start a new life. No cause of death has been released yet, but police are not suspecting foul play. These are people who died on live TV, and this one is absolutely gut turning. Many of the deaths that we witnessed on live TV are the product of 24 hour news channels because all live news events are completely unwritten. Covering things like hostage crises, attacks, and high-speed chases are bound to go terribly wrong. And there's no telling when exactly this will happen. That's exactly what led to Fox News having to issue an apology on September 28th, 2012. They were covering a high-speed chase in Arizona and even the police backed off when they realized the danger. In place, they opted to plan undercover surveillance and tailed him from the sky in a helicopter. Joe Don Romero already had a warrant out for his arrest when he stole an SUV at gunpoint earlier that morning. He weaved through traffic like a madman and sped down commercial areas and ran red lights. When he drove past a group of undercover officers, he opened fire on them through the driver's window. Some believe Joe Don had a death wish himself. And finally, after hours, he appeared to have given up. He parked the SUV with the Fox News camera zooming in on him. At this point, even the on-air reporter expressed concerns. Jodan then took off running and tumbled to the ground. He quickly jumped back to his feet and he was carrying something in his hand. You couldn't tell because of the camera angle, but it was a gun. He then walked towards some shrubbery and immediately unalived himself in the head. As hundreds of thousands of people watch, and obviously I can't show the video, but I'll show you a clip leading up to that exact moment. Just not sure about this. He's getting things out of the vehicle, clearly. Uh, it doesn't appear that there's anyone else with him. Well, you know, you wait for the end of these things and then you worry about how they may end. There's nobody else around him. Um, this makes me a little nervous, I gotta tell you. Go, oh, get off, 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 get off it, get off it, get off it! I'm sure by now most of you will have seen that Gypsy Rose Blanchard is a free woman. She's been posting a lot on social media, spending time with family over the new year, including her new husband, Ryan. She's also posted about her new documentary. The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard starts tonight at 9 in the UK on Crime and Investigation, which is available on Sky and Virgin Media, or you can stream right now on Crime and Investigation Play. Gypsy has given exclusive access in these interviews and she's been so open and raw about the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her mother Dee Dee until Dee Dee's murder in 2015. These interviews have never been seen before and even if you're already familiar with this case, you'll be shocked at the confessions of Gypsy Rose. Here's a little sneak peek at episode one. It just breaks my heart so much how much I trusted her. And it makes me angry how she took much of this child. And I don't know what she did. Gypsy describes Dee Dee as someone who was her best friend, who she loved dearly, yet Dee Dee put Gypsy through a lifetime of hell. It's really interesting to hear Gypsy talk not only about the physical abuse, but the mental and emotional abuse that she suffered at the hands of her mother. Gypsy was just a child, as you can see, and she trusted Dee Dee 100%, yet she was led to believe that she was terminally ill and needed tons of medication that she didn't actually need to take. If you'd like to hear more from Gypsy herself, then you can watch the first two hours, episode one and two, 
from 9 o'clock tonight on Crime and Investigation. The following four episodes will then be shown in two hour blocks over the next two weeks. If you're as excited about this as I am, you can find out more by going to the link in my bio. I'd also really love it if you'd come back here after you've watched the show to let me know what you think. Police got a chilling call from a missing woman's mobile phone. What they uncovered next was terrifying. Cheyenne Kluss was a 22-year-old living in Illinois. It was December 2017 and she was having a difficult time due to her mum's passing. She had been understandably really struggling to cope with the loss. She started leaning on a new guy to help her get through. The man she started dating was 38-year-old Brian Biddle. A few days prior to her disappearance, Brian ordered a taxi to pick Cheyenne up. She went in the Uber over to his house in Chicago. Now the pair were up all night partying and she was sending texts to her friends and family like everything was okay. She didn't seem distressed in any way and she was perfectly fine. Then there was suddenly a complete shift. A day later, she started sending messages to her friend at two in the morning. She was asking to be picked up and when her friend saw the message 20 minutes later, he tried to give her a ring. Worryingly, she never picked up the phone. The friend then tried to call Brian who said that he had been asleep and Cheyenne wasn't there. Her dad reported her missing and days went on with no sign of her. Then disturbingly, 12 days after she vanished, a call was made to 911 from her mobile. However, nobody said anything on the call and it promptly hung up. The operator didn't get a chance to speak with whoever made the call. Investigators were able to trace the call to a tower near Mallard Lake Forest Preserve. A search was undertaken, but it's not clear if anything of any significance was found. Then five agonizing years later, Shan's remains were discovered. They were located near South Dorchester Avenue, 17 miles away from Brian's house, and she was identified via dental records. Now, although many were suspicious of Brian, he hasn't ever been publicly named as a suspect. According to prison records that I found, he was arrested in February 2018 and later released. This was on unrelated weapons and substance charges. Cheyenne's murder tragically remains unsolved. This is by far one of the worst war videos ever explained. The video that I'm about to explain will shake you to your core and I don't recommend looking it up. The video depicts the execution of a so-called Russian spy by a Ukrainian soldier. This video is said to be from the early months of the Russian and Ukraine war. The victim in the video was allegedly a Ukrainian man feeding information to Russian forces, but there isn't any concrete proof of this. The video itself is short and it's around one minute long. It appears to be recorded in an apartment block on a staircase. As you play the video, you see a soldier and his captive kneeling in front of one another and the captive has a bag over his head. The soldier takes the bag off and he then takes a knife that looks like a bayonet and he then pushes the victim's head back against a wall and then drives the blade into the victim's left eye socket. He pushes the blade in as the victim grimaces in pain. He then pushes the victim to the ground so that he has better leverage. He then uses his palm to essentially hammer the blade deeper into the victim's eye socket. The victim is still somehow alive, but he still hasn't made a sound. The killer then takes the handle of the blade and appears to shake it or pull it out, and at this point, the victim lets out a scream that you can't describe. He wails in pain as the sound echoes throughout the apartment block. The screams are honestly borderline traumatizing. The killer continues to jiggle the blade and the screams turn even worse. At this point, the killer resumes using his palm to hammer the blade deeper into the victim's head. He hits the blade handle twice, each time pushing the blade a centimeter deeper into the eye socket. And on the second palm strike, the victim stops making noises and it appears he goes limp. It seems he drove the knife through the victim's eye and into his prefrontal cortex. The video is luckily hard to find and it seems to have been wiped from the internet and no mainstream networks ever covered it despite it being an obvious war crime. I don't recommend even trying to search it, there's no point and you are better off staying curious. This video is absolutely awful. These are deaths caught on audio, part two. This disturbing aircraft disaster claimed the lives of 70 people, and it was the result of a couple pieces of duct tape. The audio in this video may be disturbing, so this is a trigger warning. On October 2nd, 1996, a Boeing aircraft departed from the Lima airport in Peru at 12.42 a.m. Near immediately, the basic flight instruments began behaving erratically. The pilots became confused as they began receiving contradictory emergency alerts. Unfortunately, the plane was over the ocean in the pitch dark night, and neither the pilots or air traffic control were aware that their displayed altitude information was wrong. They were dangerously close to the ocean and had no way of knowing. 
Inside the cockpit, it was total chaos. Several alarms were blaring constantly. The left wing then clipped the water, causing several feet of it to break off. The pilots acted quickly and got airborne for 22 seconds, but the damage was done. The plane rolled over and smashed into the dark waves. Everybody on board died, many of which likely drowned with the aircraft. It turns out when the plane was being polished, duct tape was placed over the static ports, which measures ambient air pressure and are imperative for other systems to function. The employee didn't use a standard bright colored tape and it was missed and left on. This, along with being pitch dark and being over the ocean, made it near impossible to see how close they really were. Just take a listen to their final moments. It's absolutely disturbing. Incredibly disturbing situation has come to light recently in Mississippi involving 215 dead bodies. The extent of what has actually happened here is incredibly shocking. A community is stunned after the recent discovery of hundreds of bodies buried behind a jail in Jackson. So who are these people, how did they die and how did nobody know about this? 215 bodies were discovered in unmarked graves. Now some of the grave sites were identified with a metal tag and a number on. From what we know so far, the majority of the people found deceased in these graves were actually thought to be still alive and missing. The families of the deceased are obviously stunned and heartbroken. Most of them had absolutely no idea that their loved ones had died. The majority of the bodies had simply been thrown into the ground in body bags and the families were never notified. The smell from the grassy field was apparently so horrendous that it was attracting wildlife to forage for food. A civil rights lawyer has spoke out and said, we know based on the records from the coroner's office that since 2016 in the last eight years, we can identify 215 individuals that were buried behind that jail and their families have not been notified. This actually all came to light last October when Betterston Wade spoke out about her tragic story. Months after filing a missing persons report for her son, Dexter, aged 37, she was finally told that he was deceased. He was one of the bodies buried in the so-called paupers field. Police actually claim that Dexter was killed when an off-duty police officer ran him over. Now, the police officer was not breathalyzed at the scene. Police stated that the accident was investigated and it was determined that it was in fact an accident and there was no malicious intent. They, however, failed to tell the man's family and simply buried him in the field, calling it a lack of communication. Meanwhile, Dexter's mum was doing everything she could to try and find her son, and she contacted police in Jackson on numerous occasions. Dexter actually had a wallet with ID on his person when he died, so there was absolutely no excuse for them to say they didn't know the identity of this person. Interestingly, Betterston's brother died years prior at the hands of police. An officer slammed the 62-year-old into the ground and that officer was charged with manslaughter and was convicted. However, he is trying to appeal the conviction. The lengthy process has now begun of exhuming the bodies and trying to identify them. Understandably, the families are now calling for a federal investigation into the burials. This haunted courthouse in Texas holds a dark secret. So a few years ago, I was filming an episode here in the city, and the judge of the county actually gave me a tour of the courthouse because he's seen ghosts inside of it. But then he told me about the road, so take a good look at this road that I'm filming right now. There are three bodies in a well below this very road. The judge himself told me this story. Basically, back in the day, about a hundred years ago, three African-American men were lynched on a tree outside of this courthouse. Right next to this Confederate monument, in fact. Their bodies were then cut down and thrown into an old abandoned well. They were never retrieved, and years later, the city built a road over the well, effectively sealing it forever. To this day, nobody knows the names of those three men who were lynched that day. There's no memorial to them, and in fact, it sits, like I said before, right next to a Confederate monument. And I doubt that anybody who drives on this street even knows that they're driving over the corpses of murder victims. I think they definitely need to talk about this and erect some sort of a memorial here for the victims, but we'll see. This is the brain video, by far one of the worst prison videos ever explained. 
The video that I'm about to explain has little to no backstory, but it's believed to be from Brazil. And it made its way onto the internet in the beginning of 2017. The video appears to be filmed during the middle of a prison riot. The video itself is 2 minutes and 6 seconds long, and immediately you are met with absolute horror. As you play the video, at first it's hard to make out what's going on as it is shot in a dimly lit room. Commotion seems to be going on in the background, and a few seconds in you see a dead man laying in the corner of the room and how he was killed is unknown, but you see an inmate striking him in the head repeatedly with some sort of weapon. It looks like a homemade machete and he is striking the dead victim on the top of his skull. The cameraman makes gang signs with his fingers as this is happening. As the killer swings the machete and connects with the head, it makes wet crackling sounds which are extremely unsettling. He strikes the victim repeatedly as blood splatters on the white wall after each strike. After the killer strikes the top of the skull several times, he then goes for the throat and it appears that he is attempting to behead the deceased victim. The cameraman is talking as this is happening, and after a few seconds the camera goes dark, as the cameraman moves around to find a better angle. He eventually does and you see an inmate trying to behead the victim, though this time he is using a knife. You also see a large cavity in the victim's skull caused by the homemade machete. The knife is blunt and the killer alternates between stabbing the spinal cord to sever it and slicing it as he continues to remove the head. The killer continues doing this, and as the blade stabs into the spinal cord, it creates a crunching, grinding type sound. Eventually, after repeatedly stabbing and slicing, the knife-wielding killer beheads the victim. But this is where it gets absolutely disturbing. The killer then reaches into the opening of the victim's head, which was caused by the machete, and proceeds to pull out chunks of the victim's brain. The chunks appear white, and he holds a piece up to the camera and then squishes it in his hand and throws it on the floor. It is truly some of the most sickening and disturbing footage ever. The killer continues to rip chunks of the brain and the victim's decapitated head looks like an open watermelon or coconut at this point. The video then concludes as you see chunks of brain matter all over the floor. This video is truly one of the worst and it's seriously a disturbing watch. Whatever you do, please stay curious and never go searching for this horrific video. The true story behind this real mugshot is incredibly disturbing. This is Caius Viovis, otherwise known as Roy Gitfinski. I'm going to call him Roy for the rest of this video. In 2014, Roy was found guilty of murdering and dismembering three local men in Massachusetts. As it turns out, Roy was a self-proclaimed Satanist and believed he was a vampire with magical powers. According to prosecutors, Roy helped two of his friends kidnap these three men and shoot and kill them. As it turns out, one of Roy's close friends was a Hell's Angel Motorcycle Club member. And one of the victims was set to testify against this Hell's Angel member in an assault case in court. But unfortunately, when Roy and his two friends went to murder the witness, he had two friends with him as well. So that meant that Roy and his murder clique had to kill all three of these men. Their names were David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell. But this wasn't the first time that Roy had made national headlines for a crime he committed. In 1999, he and his then 17-year-old girlfriend had been accused of assault. Apparently, he and his girlfriend had lured a 16-year-old girl back to their hotel room. They had then sliced the girl's back open with a razor blade, licked the blood off from the wound, and began kissing each other. Police were then called when that 16-year-old girl showed up at a hospital with a 7-inch long gash on her back that required over 30 stitches. And it was back during that trial in the early 2000s when Roy claimed he was a Satanist and a vampire with a thirst for blood. He was then sentenced to 10 years in prison with 3 years suspended. After he was released though and was on parole in 2006, he was arrested again. This time he was arrested for kidnapping and drug possession after he and another male friend held two strippers hostage in a hotel room. The kidnapping charges were later dropped but he was sent back to prison for violating his probation. Then, just a few years later, he would get entangled in this triple homicide, and he was sentenced to life in prison. When images from Roy's home were shown in court, people were somewhat disturbed. Inside of Roy's house, you can see a lot of black candles, ritualistic knives and items, plenty of skulls and crossbones, witchcraft, occult paraphernalia, and a lot of knives and weapons. Now, after Roy was found guilty for his part in these three murders, he had some choice words to say to the jury. After hearing the verdict, he looked over at the jury and said, I'll see you all in hell. Remember that, every effing one of you, I'll see you all in hell. 
And this whole story makes me wonder what else Roy did in his life that people don't know about yet. Did he have a hand in other crimes? Did he commit other crimes that people don't know about? I don't know, but this story is just flat out disturbing. This man butchered his parents and then boiled his mother's head on the stove. Joel Guy Jr., 28, was studying to become a plastic surgeon in Tennessee. He'd always been supported by his parents and he'd never worked. But they were due to retire and they told Joel that he'd have to get a job because they couldn't afford for him to live off them anymore. But Joel didn't like this idea, so he decided to get rid of them and live off his inheritance instead. On November 7th, 2016, Joel bought acid, hydrogen peroxide, a knife, a bleach sprayer, and a big plastic tote, big enough to fit a human body in. Three weeks later, he put his murderous plan into action. While his mother Lisa was out buying groceries, Joel Jr. attacked his father, Joel Sr. He stabbed him with the knife over 40 times. There was a huge struggle and Joel Jr. actually received some cuts to his hands. His father literally fought for his life, but succumbed to his injuries. When Lisa returned home, she too was attacked with a knife and stabbed over 30 times. With his parents now dead, Joel set about dismembering their bodies. He removed his father's hands at the wrists and then placed them on the floor. He then removed Lisa's head, carried it downstairs and placed it in this pot on the stove. Joel Sr. and Lisa had both had their limbs disarticulated. Joel at the waist and Lisa at the knees. Joel had then placed the bodies into this blue tote and filled it with acid. He'd inflicted two large incisions to each body to allow the acid to seep in faster. Joel then calmly drove back to university to have his wounds treated at the student clinic. Lisa obviously didn't turn up for work the next day and her boss couldn't get hold of her, so she asked police to do a welfare check. What they were greeted with was like something out of a horror movie. I've seen the pictures and this crime scene was absolutely horrific. They could smell the chemicals before they even went into the house and the heating had been turned up full. As they walked through the house, their skin started to tingle with the strength of the chemicals. When they got upstairs, they saw a pair of severed hands on the floor and a bathtub covered in blood. They then discovered the acid-soaked bodies and Lisa's head boiling on the stove. Joel Jr. was placed under surveillance for a few days and the police found a meat grinder in his car. He was arrested and charged with double capital murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He's currently incarcerated in Tiptonville, Tennessee. This is the most notorious priest in all of Australia, Bernard McGrath. And because people roast me for this, he is considered to be the most notorious offender in the most notorious religious order in Australia. And yes, he's a pedophile, of course. Bernard was born in 1947 in Christchurch, New Zealand, and his father was a butcher who was previously involved with the church and wanted his son to live a life according to God and be involved with the church himself. So in 1968, Bernard took his vows, and in early 1969, he became a scholastic and worked in psychiatric wards. Keep in mind, he had taken a vow of chastity, but he reported that during his time here, he had a sexual relationship with another man, a fellow priest named Brother Berkman's Moynihan. So in 1974, he was transferred to the Maryland School in Christchurch. The prior at the school was Brother Roger Maloney, and apparently in his years at the school, Roger had fostered an environment of sexual abuse and terror. Roger Maloney would eventually be convicted of child sex abuse, but he allegedly forced Bernard to perform sex acts on him, just to keep his job. But even though written complaints were made about Roger and Bernard, nothing happened, and Roger was eventually transferred to the Vatican to work as a pharmacist, and after sexually abusing kids at this school, Bernard was transferred to another school for disadvantaged kids. By the way, this is a picture of Bernard and Roger, if you were wondering. So in 1981, Bernard became the headmaster of a school named Kendall Grange. And it was here where he had access to hundreds of disadvantaged boys who lived there on property. And he sexually abused a majority of these young boys. Parents made complaints that they heard that the headmaster was touching their children, but nothing was ever done about this. In 1992, however, Bernard was brought to a meeting with Father Brian Lucas. At the time, a lot of people had been reporting that priests and brothers had been touching children inside of churches, so Lucas was kind of the figurehead for the church's response, and he was trying to remediate all of these actions. And when Bernard met with him, he said that there would be a lot of allegations coming out against him, and so he was sent to a rehabilitation center in America. 
But then in 1993, legal troubles began for Bernard. All of his victims began to come forward and he was imprisoned for a number of years. This would be his first of five different trials that he was involved with that lasted from 1993 all the way up to 2019. And in total, he would be sentenced to about 68 years in prison for over 100 counts of abuse against boys. Obviously, he abused hundreds of children, but these were just the accounts that they could prove. And some of these accounts of the abuse are absolutely horrific. I can't read them here on TikTok, but he did terrible, terrible things to these young children. So Bernard was a part of the St. John of God order, and there were a ton of different members of this order that were eventually convicted of child sex abuse. I mean, take a look here. These are just a few of the members that were convicted eventually as well. But one of the most shocking things about this case is the cover-up. So as far back as 1977, people were reporting that Bernard was touching children in these schools. And even though this was brought up to many people in powerful positions, they always transferred Bernard, attempted to silence parents and other people that were reporting this abuse. And yeah, they never reported him to police. Thank God, though, that now he's in prison. A real man of God. There's a really strange missing persons case happening right now out of New Mexico, and we should talk about it. This is Ingrid Colleen Lane. She went missing on October 15th of this year after leaving the Bodhi Manda Zen Center in the Hamez Mountains. She went on an overnight meditation retreat to clear her head and focus on her mental health, and it's something that she had done multiple times in the past, except this time she never returned home. Ingrid was last seen that day on Forest Road 144 by two hunters after her 2019 Subaru Impreza hatchback got a flat tire. The two hunters aired up the tire for her and asked if she wanted to ride to the nearest town as it was a really remote area, but she declined and said that she wanted to hike to a local mountain peak. This all happened around 2 p.m. Unfortunately, she did not specify which mountain peak, and this would be the last interaction that she would have with anyone. Three days later, her car was found abandoned on that same road, and the rear window was smashed. And this is where things start to get strange. Inside the car was a burner phone that was still in its package, untouched, and not activated. Her family, but more specifically her husband are really confused on why that would be in her car. All of her accounts, including her cell phone, have not been active since the 15th. A massive search was launched for Ingrid, which consisted of canine units, drones, ATVs, and helicopters, but absolutely nothing has been found. The Sandoval Sheriff's Office brought in tracking dogs, which tracked Ingrid's scent in the area south and east of her vehicle on Forest Road 144, which is between Jemez Springs and Los Alamos, but it quickly died off within two miles of the vehicle. Authorities speculate she may have gotten a ride further into the mountains because of how suddenly her scent disappeared, and how the canines couldn't pinpoint a way she would have gone out. Most of Ingrid's family live in Oregon. They've spent countless hours traveling to New Mexico to search for her, but the terrain has made it really difficult. The area where she went missing is high elevation, densely forested, very remote, and way beyond cell phone range. According to a local sheriff, it's a really easy place to get lost in. Despite that, it's a really popular place in the hunting community and for avid hikers just like Ingrid, who had been to the area multiple times. Like I mentioned earlier, Ingrid had stayed at the Bodhi Manda Zen Center many times in her life. The Zen Zen Center reportedly confirmed that Ingrid had been there that day around 9 a.m., and while she was there, she meditated with the group but left shortly after. The director of the retreat said that she seemed to be in a good frame of mind and that nothing was amiss. But Ingrid completely vanished, and it's now been six weeks with no sign of her. At this point, authorities do not suspect foul play despite the odd circumstances. Her family stated that she struggles with sleep and mental health, but they don't believe that she went into the mountains not planning to come back for many reasons. One reason being is that she was really happy before this happened, planning on going back to work the next week, making plans, and just overall excited about her future. She and her husband are described as having a once-in-a-lifetime type of love, and they say that it would be so out of character for her to just leave without saying anything. Ingrid also has a rare lung problem that worsens when it's cold out, so it would be extremely unlikely that she would intentionally hike far away from her car that day. She also just wasn't packed to camp or be gone for an extended period of time. Her family has searched Tacoma, which is reportedly the highest point in the area, as as well as San Antonio Mountain. But because it's now winter, the dangerous terrain has made it really difficult to continue searching by foot. I've attached a GoFundMe in my bio created for the family so that they can continue funding the search for Ingrid. They plan to conduct as many helicopter searches as they can with the funds. If you're local to New Mexico, please share this any way that you can. Right now, having her face out there is so important. Ingrid is described as 5'5", 120 pounds, and has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information at all, please call the Sandoval Sheriff's Office at 505-867-7526.
There have been a lot of updates in the case of Nancy Ng, a woman who went missing during a yoga retreat to Guatemala last month, so let's talk about it. But be warned, these details will make your blood boil. If you need a full breakdown of the case, I posted an in-depth video about it last week, which you can go back and watch if you need to. The witness who was the last person to see Nancy alive has officially been publicly named. Her name is Christina Blasick, and she's a San Bernardino County public defender. Christina was on the same yoga retreat as Nancy, who disappeared on October 19th while kayaking on Lake Aditlan. It's now been four weeks since Nancy went missing, and Christina is only now speaking out for the first time through her attorney, Christopher Gardner. Nancy was last seen on video in her kayak on the lake, which was a little after 11 a.m. on the day she went missing. According to Christina, all 10 of the tourists went out with no safety training or life jackets, and once on the lake, they kind of all just went their separate ways. The water was reportedly becoming rough, so Christina started to head back to shore when she crossed paths with Nancy, who said she wanted to go swimming. According to Christina, she warned Nancy not to because the water was pretty rough, and there was a good current, but Nancy reportedly jumped off her kayak anyway. Christina then says that she retrieved Nancy's kayak as it floated away, but she lost her grip. And after she got it for the second time, she turned around and Nancy was nowhere to be found. Christina then says that she immediately started screaming Nancy's name and screamed as much as she could, but she said that the water was pitch black and that she couldn't see anything, so she ultimately went back to shore for help. After she got to shore, she was greeted by the organizer of the retreat slash yoga instructor who has also since been publicly named. His name is Eddie Ramada, and according to both of them, once the distressed Christina got back to shore, he shielded her from onlookers and quickly rushed back to the hotel where all 10 of the tourists were staying. Christina allegedly told Guatemalan authorities what she saw, and they apparently told her that there was nothing that could be done and that Lake Auditlan is known for having people drown in it. This, of course, is everything that Christina told her attorney, who then released the statement. Nancy was then reported missing after hotel staff could not locate her. According to Lee Beal, the owner of the kayak rental company, the group was not scheduled to leave the next morning. But as we all know, within 12 hours of Nancy's disappearance, all nine of the other tourists quickly checked out of the hotel without saying a word or talking to authorities. And they also did not pay for their excursion. But this is where things start to not really add up. After Nancy's family received a phone call from Eddie stating that she disappeared, they reached out to Christina, who again was the last person to see her alive, to see if she would talk to them and to help authorities locate Nancy. But Christina was silent. In fact, Nancy's family reached out to her multiple times, but she refused to say a word to them. Eddie reportedly told Nancy's family that Christina was too traumatized by the incident to speak with them. So they patiently waited for the police report, as that's all they could really do. And when they got it five days later, strangely enough, Christina's witness statement was nowhere in the official police report. There was actually not even one record of a single interview with Christina. Nancy's family and many others, including myself, are wondering why it took Christina so long to speak up and tell her side of what happened. Nancy's family has been begging her for information since the beginning, but for some reason it took her four weeks and getting an attorney to release any information. And according to the family, this is the first time that they're even hearing of this story. Nancy's family has since had to hire an independent search and rescue team called Black Wolf Helicopters, who have been the only ones to extensively search Lake Aditlan and the surrounding areas, as Guatemalan authorities called off the search after just three days. According to Chris Sharp of Black Wolf Helicopters, they've already searched roughly 95% of the lake and have also searched by land and air. However, since no one came forward and told authorities where Nancy even went into the lake, it's made finding her extremely hard and has severely hindered the investigation. According to Chris, Christina's statement about the water being pitch black is extremely valuable and would have been useful at the beginning of the investigation. They could have focused their search on the deepest part of the lake where the water is opaque, based on her description of the color change. But of course, this information only recently came to light, four weeks later. Black Wolf Helicopters is hoping to bring in a sonar expert with this information to investigate deeper than five feet into the water. With the little information that witnesses are willing to give, time is of the essence to find Nancy. The fact that the only witness who who last saw Nancy alive took four weeks to even just come forward is so bizarre to me. And it's just not fair to the family to have the only person who knows something just willingly not speak up when they need answers. I'd like to remind everyone of the GoFundMe in my bio for the family to help continue funding the search for Nancy. At this point, her family is questioning everything and they just want to bring Nancy home as it's now been a month since she was last seen. This terrifying New Year's Eve murder case took 35 years to solve, and they used a single cigarette to crack the whole case. Hi, I'm Meg. I talk about your crime. Let's get into this case. This case takes place in Florida in 1984-5 because it was on New Year's Eve. A 23-year-old mother called Tanya McKinley was off to the bar to celebrate New Year's. The bar was called Daryl's Bar, and she was meeting some friends there. 
She had an 18 month old baby boy who was her entire world. She adored him, well, as most mothers do. Tanya had a great night with her friends and they went into the new year together. Countdown happened, celebrations continued, and she leaves the bar at around 1.30 a.m. And she left completely alone. Four hours later in the early, early, oh, I just poked my eye. Only four hours later, a couple was taking their pet to the emergency vet when they came across a half-clothed body in a parking lot. As you can probably guess, it was Tanya. This parking lot was seven miles away from the bar. Tanya had unfortunately been essayed and strangled. But from the beginning when police got there, they thought they were gonna solve this super fast. They were sure it was probably someone she already knew. It was like a cookie cutter case. They found loads of DNA samples. So they had whoever did this as DNA. And so all they had to do was match it to someone. Easy right? Wrong. They went through every suspect they had and none of the DNA ever matched up. They literally had this man's hair, a hair sample, and they couldn't match it to anyone. Mind you, this was the 80s, so obviously DNA technology was nowhere near as advanced as it is now. So all they had to go off was that it was a man. That was it. And the case would eventually go cold. Police really didn't want to give up on it, so like yearly, they would go over it again and again, and every year there was nothing. And because she was a single mother, that poor 18-year-old baby, I believe he was raised by her family, so he knew of his mother's fate, but he never knew why or who until he turned 35. Probably at that point, he never thought he would know. Anytime there was new DNA technology, the case would be revisited. And like a lot of these older cases that I cover, it was solved using the genealogy database. So in 2020, they took this DNA and they put it through that database. It's very much like those ancestry websites. So they put the DNA through and even if they find a distant cousin to whoever that DNA belongs to, they can eventually create a family tree and backtrack. And that's exactly what they did. And after all these years, they build that family tree and they find the guy that they think did it but they needed to prove it. They needed to match him to the 35 year old DNA they had from the crime scene. But how? Because if they, if they made him aware of it, he would probably try and like flee. So naturally they just followed him until he discarded something, a cup, anything with his DNA on it. Can you imagine like 35 years later, there's no way he thought the police was like on his trail. He was probably so smug about getting away with it as well. They hit the jackpot when he dropped a used cigarette bud on the floor and they grabbed that and they tested it and ding, ding, ding. They had the guy. His name was Daniel Leonard Wells and he hadn't had any convictions like this. I think he had one for battery, but like battery murder. Yeah, so he had never supposedly done anything like this that they know of. But finally, they had him, which I can't imagine the relief. Like, this went over three generations. Now you might be wondering, what about the 18-month-old baby? Like, where was he? He was 35 years old, and he gave up hope a long time ago. And he never even got to know his own mother. Yet his whole life, he's just been wanting this case to be solved. It would be some sort of closure. Do you know what I mean? Who did it? Why did he do it? I think the why was probably quite important to him. The son said, and I quote, My mom never got to be a part of my life. Nothing could ever make up for losing my mom. But at least now I know what happened to her. But then something infuriating happened. Daniel Wells unalived himself in his jail cell before the trial could even happen. So not only did Tanya's loved ones go 35 years not knowing who did this, the moment they find him, they don't even have a chance to ask why. I can't even begin to fathom the frustration that they must have felt. Like his mother never really got a trial, even when they got the guy. This is another quote from the son. He said, Wells is a coward. He didn't even wait until the trial started. It's frustrating for our family on a lot of levels because we waited so long to get justice. 
now it seems like we just have a lot more unanswered questions. And that, that's the case. No one will ever truly know what happened to Tanya that night. What led to this? Did he follow her from the bard? Why did he target her? Why? Just why? They're never going to know. But at least they got the guy and they know that he's not still out there because I guess that that would be worse. I hope that her family and loved ones like somehow are able to find peace um, with at least the fact that he's not out there anymore. The fact that he was able to live those 35 years like free and no one caught him is just disgusting. Like, ugh, I hate people. <laughs> it's just like, who out there has also gotten away with something like that? You know? Anyways, that is all for this case. And this is also the last case of 2023. I hope that you guys have a really fun New Year's. And I hope you had a good Christmas. I've not done any videos since Christmas. I'm really sorry. I'm going to be better this year. I've had so much going on that, like, I just, I couldn't. I couldn't. Life just got a little hectic and in the way recently, but I will be consistent in the new year. I forced myself to wake up before work and film this, so I'm on five hours sleep, but it's all for you guys. So please make sure that the video does well. Thank you. I wish you all the best in the new year, and I guess I'll see you then. Bye. Imagine letting all three of your kids go play outside only for all three of them to disappear. Unfortunately, that was the reality for Jane and Jim Beaumont. The case of the missing Beaumont children was one of the largest police investigations in Australian criminal history, and it remains one of Australia's most infamous cold cases ever. Hi, I'm Meg. I talk about your crime. Let's get into this case. The Beaumont family lived in a suburb in Adelaide, Australia, not far from a beach called Glenel Beach. It was a popular spot that the kids absolutely loved visiting. There were three Beaumont kids. The eldest was Jane. He was nine years old. Arna was seven years old and the youngest Grant was only four. On the 25th of January, 1966, there was a heat wave in Australia, a summer heat wave. It was hot. So the father of the kids, Jim, dropped them off at Glenel Beach for the day. Jane was apparently very mature for her age. All of the kids knew how far out they could swim and they also knew not to speak to strangers. I see people critique the parents for letting their kids go out together, but at the age of nine, I was also going to the park and stuff with my friends alone. So it's definitely not unheard of. The kids returned home from the beach and they had had an amazing day and they wanted to go again the next day. The next day was actually Australia Day, and they asked their mother if they could go again. It was way too hot because of this heat wave, so the mother put them on the bus at 8.45, heading to Glenel Beach. And the kids agreed to meet back with their mother at noon at the same bus stop. When noon came around, Nancy Beaumont went to the bus stop and waited for her kids. They were not on the bus that she expected them to be on, so she waited and more and more buses came and the children were nowhere to be seen. Nancy started getting concerned and Jim returned home from work at around 3 p.m. At this point, he immediately drove to Glenel Beach to start looking for the kids, but he couldn't find them. So he tried going to like friends' houses nearby to see if maybe they went there, not there. At 5.30 p.m., the parents then went to the police and filed a report. The police weren't too worried to begin with. They thought that maybe the kids lost track of time or something. And three children going missing all at once was pretty much unheard of. Just in case though, they started monitoring the roads around Glenel Beach. And within 24 hours of the kids disappearing, the entire nation was aware of these kids. Three days then passed and people started really getting worried. They really started fearing the worst because this wasn't just kids walking off at this point. Someone had taken them. The kids had a total of 17 items with them and not a single one was ever found. A woman came forward saying she had spoken to kids who matched the description of the Beaumont children at 7 p.m. that evening, but nothing ever really came of that. Quite a lot of people actually had seen what they thought was the Beaumont children that day, with a tall man. He had light brown hair and a very thin face. He seemed to be in his mid thirties and apparently the kids seemed really comfortable around him, which is why no one suspected him when they saw him with the children. The weird part about that detail is that the kids were apparently very, very shy. 
and that them being comfortable around a stranger was extremely out of character. This detail led investigators to believe that this was not the first time the kids had met this man. Perhaps they had met him the day before or a previous visit, and the trust kind of grew. The middle child, Arna, had actually said to her mother that her older sister, Jane, had a boyfriend at the beach. And Nancy didn't really think anything of this comment. You know, she thought it was just another boy on the beach that Jane had a crush on. But then she realized that maybe this boyfriend was the man who took the kids. The kids had also been seen buying food with more money than their mother had given them that morning. So where did they get that money? And alongside their usual order, the kids ordered a meat pie. And all three kids didn't like meat pie. So it's looking like this man got them to order for him and gave them money for it. Another sighting was from a postman who knew the children quite well, saying that he saw them walking at around 2.55 p.m. that day, but he didn't see a man, and they seemed to have been heading home. That was basically all the police had and all the parents could go off of, which is just not a lot at all. Like, I can't imagine one day you're a parent to three kids, and the next, you your kids are gone. They're gone. One is bad enough. One is traumatic enough. But all three? Two years into the search, the family started receiving letters. It was someone claiming that they had the kids and they were willing to give them back for a certain amount of money. It ended up leading nowhere, but 24 years later, they tested the letters again and it turns out it was just a high school boy trying to mess with the family. Like, that is literally the lowest of the lows. If I found out my teenager did that, I would disown them. On the spot. Disown. Seven years after the Beaumont children went missing, two other kids went missing under very, very similar circumstances. It was two girls and their parents had literally left them for a second to go to the washroom and they were never seen again. And later that day, the girls would be seen walking with a man who matched the same description as the man who took the Beaumont children. That is everything that the police had in this investigation, which is not a lot. Let's get into theories on who might have done it. This case has a lot of suspects, but I'm going to mention the only one that I truly believe could have done this. It's a man called Harry Phillips. When the Beaumont children paid for that food, they used a one pound note, which their mother had not given them any notes. She gave them coins. And this is kind of weird, but Harry Phillips was known for like giving out one pound notes to kids. So he somewhat matched the description and apparently had a thing for kids. His own son named Hayden, who was 15 at the time that the kids went missing, said that they were all playing in the backyard on the day that the Beaumont children went missing. So he took them home. Harry Phillips lived only 300 meters from the beach, which would have made this possible. It would also explain how the kids had maybe seen him before that day and gotten to know him because he lived right next to the beach. It also would have explained why he didn't enter the bakery to get the food with the kids because maybe the guy who owned the bakery would have recognized him. Two men came forward in 2013 claiming that around the same time the kids went missing, Harry got them to dig a deep hole on his factory grounds for him. If that's not suspicious, I don't know what is. That site was ex excavated, excavated twice, but they found nothing. Remember when I said the kids had a bunch of items on them? Well, Jane carried a little purse with her. It was described as a white clip purse. And when he passed away, police kind of had a look in his house and they found a very similar purse in the basement. And Harry's wife was like, oh no, I, I just bought that purse. But it was on a shelf in the basement as like a display, which... If you know a lot about like serial killers and killers is that they like to keep little mementos. The police then asked her why the purse was displayed in the basement if she had just bought it and she immediately asked them to leave. Like, I smell suspicious on that. They later returned to the house again to have a look at this purse. And guess what? It was gone. She claimed that she had thrown it out. And that is everything for the missing Beaumont children case. I find it really sad that the parents never got justice. They never got to find out where all three of their kids went. I can't even begin to imagine 
the effect this had on the parents. Like, I really hope that somehow, someday, this gets solved. And if it does, you guys will hear about it. But yeah, that is everything on the case of the missing Beaumont children. I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know what case you want to do next. See you in the next video. Bye!